Well, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you're uh, coming to us from here uh, today. Uh, welcome to another Wiesman webinar. Uh, my name is Scott Bootler. I'm coming to you live from Langley, British Columbia today. Uh, I'm assisting uh, Mark Norris, who is coming to us from Waterloo, Ontario. Uh, and uh, today's topic is the Vitotron 100 uh, wall hung electric boiler. Mark's going to go through a little introduction and some uh, concepts as far as installation and a little bit of troubleshooting so you're going to get a pretty full gamut as far as uh, information on this uh, little boiler it's been a popular um product for us here uh, i know at least on the in uh, on the canadian side of the border here we we've, we've gone through quite a few of these here on the west coast so it uh, should be interesting for those that are in attendance here today uh before i uh, i hand the controls over to mark there just a mention there are a couple of ways you could uh, get in contact with us here uh, as Mark is going through the presentation, you can always feel free to uh, ask questions. We prefer you throw those in the chat, uh, or sorry, the uh, question and answer Q&A box. That way there uh, at the end, uh, when we um, finish this uh, presentation, we can uh, send those Q&A. We usually send the question and answers out uh, with the presentations if it's requested. So all that stuff will be documented in real time as we move through here. Um, other than that, uh, I think we're uh, ready to go, Mark. How are things going on your end? Good, Scott. It's a nice day in Excellent. Ontario here, and uh, we will uh, get going looks on this. The background. This... Yeah. Hmm? yeah. Well, it's uh, actually so it looks good for the background there. I'm not really sitting on the lawn in front of the building. Ah, it might I be a little chilly for uh, that in a T-shirt. Yeah, I thought uh, you're on your John Deere or something on the lawn there. But no, okay. no. No. We, we, they make us multitask, but lawn grooming is part of it. <laughs> oh, well, landscaping. I do it. I don't here, have to so do any like... catering, anything like that, right? Oh, okay. Fix okay. Is fixing, there repairing, teaching, help, tech support. Those are all part of my uh, task. Okay. But lawn care That's and catering, no, I don't do that. Yeah. Is that a fact? Although I do put okay, out I lunch. i got to talk to head office then. I do put I out start lunch. start talking to HR then because yeah. Yeah, you Because they got uh, you on the lawn more? what I do here. There you go. They do, yeah, absolutely. Washing dishes, et cetera. That's terrible, man. All right. All right. No I wonder know. you don't have any time to do seminars anymore. I do feel electric today on this. Do you electric? Oh, webinar, that's so that's. We're looking forward to. Uh, that was low. Yeah, it's that going to be low. a powerful presentation. I know. Yeah, we'll I'm see. The dad puns here. Okay, I better get going. So Scott can stop this. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to stop. I'm going to mute myself. Okay. Uh, welcome right. everybody to the uh, this webinar on the Vitatron. Um, we did a similar presentation earlier, and when we Right before we introduce this product, uh, this one here has got a little bit more in it and uh, maybe some examples of how we can use this uh, product in a heat pump application. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to mute my camera here, too, so that we can because uh, I think the camera takes up part of the screen. So that way we'll do that and we'll get going. OK, so this is the Vitatron 100 at a wall mounted electric boiler. Uh, when we first introduced this, there was some confusion on whether it was an electric boiler, whether they had it classified as a electric space heating water heater, and you, you all kind of got confused on what they were doing. Uh, but it is now officially electric boiler. It, is not, it doesn't have to be classified as electric water heater. It's the same product. It's just how UL lists it. And uh, it was listed as a boiler, and then it wasn't listed as a boiler, and then it was listed as a boiler. So now we're officially a boiler. Um this is a product we have had on for, I don't know, a year or two maybe now. Um, it is uh, the first generation of our electric boilers in Canada. Uh, this will be just the beginning of what we're going to do. We're going to be bringing these boilers to uh, Canada in bigger sizes, higher temperatures, um, maybe a few other bells and whistles to add to it. Uh, but this is the product that we started with. Because it was very simple for us to, the the, the fa factory where we build this, the Wiesman plant we build this in Poland, actually already had this product uh, almost ready to go for North America. So we just kind of jumped on it and took it with it. So, but they are also in development of other products. So uh, they come in sizes from 4, 6, 8, 12, and 14.4 kilowatts. Uh, so in the BTU world, that's 13.6 all the way up to 49.147. Um, these are 240 volt single phase appliance, so they have to be um, set up properly or you know, wired and breakered properly. You can see that the uh, rated current is is uh, 60 amps on the largest one, and it requires, based on the electrical code requirements, requires an 80 amp breaker. 
Now, there is a second circuit that's required for this. And in this current version, it comes into the boiler or the as a separate 120 volt circuit. And that was for the pump control. Now, the pump control is 120 volt uh, single phase, 15 amps. Now, interestingly enough with that, though, that the whole entire pump circuit inside the boiler is fused at two circuits of two amps each. So if you look at the way that works, what we did in Waterloo is we brought the, we had a custom panel built by our controls guys in, in house here who do all of our custom panels. And what we did is we brought a um, four wire system in, so two, two hots, a neutral and a ground. Uh, and that way we could split out inside this distribution panel, the 120 volt circuit. And we were just able to bring in one power source rather than have to bring two separate power sources. So if you can see in this diagram, we come in with, we have the, the power coming from the disconnect uh, from the breaker panel through uh, the main internal switch. And at this point, here's where we have two, the 240 volt circuit, the two fused here. And then we break it off here to give a separate 120. And because we brought the neutral in, we can bring the neutral across to all of this. Now, this panel is a little overkill. I didn't give the panel guys any kind of restrictions or any kind of guideline other than I want two circuits. So they kind of took it upon themselves to make a Cadillac. So there's 240 volt fuse here. Uh, fuses there. There's a 120 volt fuse here for the 115 side, uh, and they even fused all of the pilot lights. Uh, the other thing they did is they brought a circuit coming back from the boiler for a for the auxiliary pump, so that they could bring it into the boiler and in future put a pilot light in and run the run the power to, from the wiring to the um, pump from there. So there's a little more elaborate than what you would really need, but the big point here is that there's 240 volts with a neutral. That allows us to get 120 volt with the neutral out to to the boiler, uh, and that makes it so that we can, um, you know, you have the 240 for the main power and 120 for the pump power, all from the same breaker. And when you look at the load calculation, let's say on the 14 kilowatt version, you can still do that within the breaker size and not not have to go up on a breaker size or something like that because of the load draw on those pumps. So the pump circuit is 120 volts. Uh, the internal pump is a is a Velo uh, Star three-speed pump. Uh, it is a 0.97 full load amps, and it is fused at two amps. The external pump would be similar, so it is also fused at two amps. Now, it, it would be pump specific. I'm not going to put any numbers on here because whatever pump you decide to use, it'll be based on that. But remember that the maximum fuse rating on that circuit is going to be two amps. As far as the overall of the boiler goes, we have a maximum operating temperature of 140. So this is a low temp boiler. Um, it, it does, so people ask me all the time, can I do domestic hot water with it? It's kind of borderline for that if you want domestic hot water like at 120 degrees or something like that you might be able to to do that through a, through a heat exchange we're not going to run potable water through this boiler might be able to do that through an indirect tank or something like that but you got to remember that the maximum temperature of this boiler is going to be 140 so take that into consideration when you're doing that uh, it has a manual reset high limit which shuts everything down in the whole appliance i'll go over that in more detail as we go through here set at 194 um, one of the things I really want to point out here is the inlet and outlet piping. This is a BSTP female three quarter inch thread connection. Now, if you're not familiar with BSPT or NPT with the comparison to NPT, BSPT is British standard pipe thread. And the difference between BSPT and NPT fittings is the BSPT threaded threads are not tapered. Where on our North American fittings, we typically you know put T-tapered dope or something on it and we tighten it up. And because the fitting's tapered, it tightens itself. With the BSPT fittings, they don't have the taper. So what they do is they need a gasket in there required for, uh, to seal it. So it tightens into the gasket. Uh, now, because of that, um, you can use a standard NPT fitting in this connection, but you have to remember that you should gasket it so that it isn't going to leak. Now, when you gap, put a gasket on it, when you look at a standard, let's say a black nipple, it's a fairly sharp edge on that nipple. So what we prefer to do is use something with a more flat edge on it. So if you were using, um, let's say, uh, press fit fittings, that NPT fitting to press fit will have a fairly wide uh, um, 
flat edge on the threaded side, and then that will seat the gasket well. Or if you're using PEX or something like that, those fittings tend to have a little sharp, a little flatter edge than the NPT fittings. Now we have some solutions for that. As we go along, I'll show you that. You know, if you don't want to do that, if you're not comfortable doing that, how we have some solutions for that. Uh, it is a built-in expansion tank at 1.6 gallons. That's fairly small by industry standards, but it, it is enough to, to satisfy the boiler in a small heating circuit. Uh, you can certainly add another uh, expansion tank anywhere else in the system. Uh, one thing about expansion tanks is you really can't make them too big. Uh, safety relief is 30 PSI, and the maximum pressure rating on this boiler is 30 PSI. Uh, it has a minimum operating pressure of 7 PSI, so there is actually a pressure switch internal to the boiler, which will stop its operation at 7 PSI. Its dry weight is 68.5 pounds. For all you guys who are complaining about how heavy the wall hung boilers were getting and, and all of those problems, you know, the bigger cabinets and the and the and the heavier boilers, uh, this one's 70 pounds. That's all it is, right? So and the size of it is 28 by 18 by almost 10. It's a very small, compact machine, and it has really almost everything you need to get the system going internally to it. It has a minimum flow rate of 1.32 gallons. There is a flow sensor in there, which will actually trigger it, uh, it off before that, about two gallons. But you can see we can get down to really low flow rates. That's just the image of the numbers I already showed you, so we'll just keep moving. Uh, it has a hinged cabinet. So you see there's a hinges on the left-hand side here, and there's one screw on the top and two screws on the bottom to get the door open, and then it just swings to the left. So once you've got the door open, you're inside here and you've got the wiring entrance for the 120, 240 volt and the terminal block. So this is the 120 and this is the 240 volt block. It has the step down transformer. So you see here the step down transformer, which is 240 to 24 volts. Uh, the main contactors here, just behind the, the, the operating control. Uh, these are two contactors that split L1 and L2 for the three heaters and the, and the control. And we have a built-in pump. So the built-in pump down here is, a, like I said, a Velo three-speed pump. Uh, again, sorry, I missed the main control, so the main control being here. Uh, it has a magnetic strainer. So this is a, a typical Y strainer with a magnetic filter inside it. So it will grab and hold on to those uh, metal particles to keep them out of the system. Pressure sensor down here. We've got the boiler's water pressure sensor. This is what is the low pressure limit. This will shut off the boiler when it gets below that pressure. Automatic air vent way up at the top here. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but it's right on the top of the heat exchanger. A 24-volt fuse. So this fuse here fuses the 24-volt side of the transformer, and everything beyond that is part of the limit circuit, um, and so the fuse is part of the main um, full-stop limit. There are three heating elements in each of the heat exchangers. doesn't matter what size they are. There's three heating elements, and they're just different size elements, and if you ever had to replace... Um, the unit you're replacing this whole piece with the black here, it's going to come as an assembly because it's all hermetically sealed. The adjustable high limit and the fixed high limit. So down here we have the adjustable high limit, which is set at 140, and the fixed high limit, which is a manual reset, set at uh, 194. And I'll go for the functions of these two as we go through, how you know which, ones are, which one is, uh, is giving you an issue if that's happening. The power module, which is this piece right here, this is where all of the business is done to turn the heaters on and off. It's a series of three triacs, uh, and I'll go into more detail about triacs in a little bit. And it is triggered by the control to determine how many triacs need to be running. And each triac can actually run in two separate levels of power. So what we have is six stages of heat inside this boiler. Um, so that it has it has some turn down to it. That's pretty simple. In and out, we have, they actually put red and blue tape on these from the factory so you don't get mixed up. Bypass valve here, which maintains the minimum flow rate through the boiler. This is the flow and temperature sensor. So it looks at the outlet flow of the heat exchanger and the temperature of the outlet of the water temperature. So went back to the air vent here. It sits at the top of the boiler. But one of the neat things about this is a 3 8 inch air vent sits on the top. But what we have is a little poly tube that goes here and goes all the way down and out the bottom of the boiler. So if you ever had an air vent that failed because it was, you know, the float got stuck and it was leaking or whatever, uh, all that water goes out the bottom of the boiler. None of it goes inside the boiler. There's the expansion tank. And you can see it's a pancake type expansion tank. This is quite common in Europe. They use these. We don't see a lot of them in North America, but they work just the same. Uh, it has got the attachment for the Schrader valve. 
and the connection to the water on the bottom so it's easily accessible. Uh, it is pressure set to 14 PSI. So it is a little bit higher than you would see in a normal, let's say, expansion tank you buy from your wholesaler in Canada or I think even in the USA. So it can be adjusted. You want to do that before you hook it up to the system. So if you know your system needs to have an expansion tank set at 16 PSI or 12 PSI, then you would do that before you connect it to the system so it's not seeing any pressure by backflow. Um, and that can be done through the Schrader valve at the bottom of the tank. Now, if you ever had to remove the tank, say you had to replace it for some reason, um, the boiler would have to come off the wall to do that because it mounts in from the back. But that's something that you're really not going to see, I wouldn't think. There's the pressure relief valve. It's 30 PSI. It is rated for the horizontal position. This is something I found that guys don't um, always understand or don't realize that your pressure relief valves are not all related for this horizontal position. On this sticker label, which you find comes on every pressure relief valve, it'll tell you what the orientation that this relief valve is designed for. And I, did a, I looked at it just to make sure, uh, because I'm trusting that way. Uh, and it is rated for the horizontal position. But if you look at most of our normal pressure relief valves, like say on our Vita Dens or our CI2 boilers, they are rated in the vertical position. Those relief valves are not designed to be put in the horizontal. So just a, just a, maybe a side note for other installations, uh, this one here is rated for the horizontal. There's the pressure bypass valve. So it has an adjustment dial here, which you set to bypass a certain amount of water when the uh, flow rate in the system drops. So how we set that, you can see that we have a main flow. Let's say the flow is reduced here because of zone valves or things like that. Then what we have is the bypass valve will bypass water this way so that what we have is a flow from the pump to the heat exchanger to the, this way. So we always maintain a minimum flow rate through the boiler. How do we set that? The first thing we're going to do is we're going to take that dial and turn it all the way clockwise until it stops. Then we're going to turn all the heating zones on. So that might mean we manually open all the valves or we turn all the thermostats up or whatever that's going to happen. All the pumps need to be running in the secondary side too. Uh, and then we, we want to see when that flow is going to bypass. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn that bypass a valve counterclockwise until we feel the temperature start to increase on the bypass of the valve. And then we're going to turn it a one more turn just to get it set. So when we turn it till we just feel the temperature rise, that's called the tipping point. And turning it one more turn sets it up straight. There's a strainer. So you can see what we have here is the screen. And then we have the magnetic filters here. Um, so this needs to be serviced periodically like every strainer does. Uh, here, here's one trick that I've learned over being in this industry for, you know, 40, almost 40 years. That when I buy a strainer from anybody... Before I actually hook it up and connect it, or I might hook, hook the pu uh, piping up to it, but before I connect it, what I am going to do is pull that cap off. And I've just found it's good housekeeping for me to do that because I know that when you get a strainer when they from the factory, they put those on with a fair bit of torque. And then you've got the boiler heating the water up and it gets really tight. Um, so I always take it off and put it back on. Uh, that way, next time I want to remove it, it's not it's not too hard to do. There's my three quarter inch uh, BSPT fittings. And there you see the red and the blue tape on the, on the pipe fittings. So if you're not comfortable with adapting the NPT to the BSPT, uh, we have a couple of solutions for you. We have these flex hoses, which are um, three quarter inch by three quarter inch. Uh, and then they, they, you can just, again, the gasket at that, uh, or we have these, G thread to MPT thread adapters. Both of these are available as spare parts or, or um, uh, optional parts. Uh, there's the part number if you want to, you know, quickly jot them down. If you call, you know, our order desk or the wholesaler, they should be able to figure that out. Um, but this allows you to do the piping a little bit cleaner, a little bit easier for you if you want. A lot of guys like these flex lines because it makes it easier to get the, the the building piping adapted to this. There's a quick. Um, drawing of what goes on inside the boiler. So like I said, we have the 115 volt circuit from the pumps. We have the 240 volt circuit from the uh, main for the main power. Uh, and the amperage of that is based on how many, what the heater elements are. So what the, bo the boiler size is. Uh, the internal pump here. So it is already factory wired to P1. And the external pump, if you're doing primary, secondary, it can be wired to P2. 
And both of these pumps always run together. So when, when there's a call for a pump, they both start, they both run for about three minutes after that call for heat to finish them off and just to pull more heat out of it before they shut down. And we'll come back and talk a little bit about closer about this in a couple of seconds, but this OP uh, terminal is about disabling the boiler from an external source. So the OP is actually an idea from the utilities. When the utility rate is high, they would send a signal that the electric appliances wouldn't run. And that's what it's originally designed for, but it could be used for any kind of disabled function. And, I'll, and I'll, when we go through the controls, we'll see how you know when that's open and closed and how we ship it. So there is a basic diagram of the triax and how the triax work. So down at the bottom, we have a, a diagram of a triac. If you've never seen that before, basically the triac is the power goes in one end and it can't go through until the gate is powered or the gate signal is sent. Once the gate signal is sent, power will go through the triac. And it's because there's basically two diodes in opposite directions, it, it passes AC voltage. Uh, so the, the all trick of this is the gate, though. The gate will be will be powered or energy to it when the track is supposed to pass energy, and it will be no energy to it when the gate is supposed when the track is not supposed to pass energy. So this is I've used these a lot over the years in a whole bunch of different things. Uh, I've used them on lighting systems. I've used them on motor controls. I've used them on all sorts of stuff over the years, uh, and they are very simple, relatively inexpensive for the amount of power they handle. Uh, very simple control device. Now, what we're doing with this is we're sending not just an on-off signal to this. We will pulse this signal so the triac turns on and off quickly. And again, it's not a relay. It's a solid-state device, so that's not going to wear out doing that uh, to control the modulation rate. So we'll power it 100% of the time for 100% load. And because we're going to power it on and off for half the cycle for 50% load, and there's three triacs, so that's how we get the three stages of heat. So from the contacts, use L1, L2, L1, L2. L1 is essentially the power to the power unit, so X inputs. And the other side of this, um, L2 goes to X4 and to the other side of all the heater elements. So using that knowledge on the board, we have X123 and X4 and H123. We can troubleshoot very simply whether that triac is running or not running, whether it's in good shape or bad shape, uh, whether I have a problem with a heater element and, and not to control. And we'll we'll go through that when we get to the troubleshooting side of things. So there's a closer look at the 120 volt circuit. Again, 120 volt comes in here. It's actually going to go out through one of these K outputs and come back, depending on whether they want the pump to run. Then P1 is wired, hardwired to the boiler pump and P2 is accessory pump if you want to use it. Uh, this is all pretty standard electrical stuff, so I'm going to jump right over this, you know, 120 volts, and a half-inch knockout, all that kind of stuff. So what happens with the control is 120 volt comes in. It goes out on K2 to the main controller. If the main controller says, I want the pump to run, it sends a signal back on K1. And after K1 is powered, these two fuses get power. So when you look at it internally, K, K1 comes back and fuse one and fuse two are powered at the same time. So these two pumps are always started together. They're not staged. They're not cycled by some separate controller. They're always cycled together. They will go through. Each has their own two amp fuse and then out to the pump or out to the second pump. And that's basically how this system works. The main control closes a relay internally to decide when we need the pumps to operate. And then they both run together. So the internal um, pump, again, controlled by this board, if fused by the fuse that's for P1, uh, then there's a three-speed pump. I can set it to where I want it to be for the, for the pump speed. You see, like most of these little um, wet rotor pumps, there's an air bleeder on the back of this. Uh, I found we needed to do this when we set our boiler up. We had to bleed it a little bit. So um, once we got it bled, it was fine. And like I said before, after that, call for heat after the boiler is turned off the heater elements the pump will run for an additional three minutes now we give you this pump curve in the manual 
If you know anything about what we do with our pump curves and any boiler we, we sell that has an internal pump, what we do is a calculation of disposable or available or a uh, um, head that is left over. And we've taken out all the pressure drop and the flow requirements of the boiler itself and all the internal components like the bypass and all that stuff that's inside this boiler. That's all been taken out of the logic here, uh, out of the pump curve. So what you have here is what's left over for your building, what you can use to circulate water. This boiler does not require primary, secondary. And what we do with it then is that you can say, it does my building loop um, have enough, you know, we have the right flow and head drop um, that I can use the residual head of this pump. So as an example, if I needed 3.3 gallons a minute and I needed it at about 12 feet of head, that was my pressure drop, then I could go across here and say, that's a little bit outside, maybe close enough that it would work. But let's say I only had 10 feet of head. I could say, well, that's actually between pump setting two and three. So I could set it at three. But if I only need six feet of head at that 3.3 gallons, you can see that I can do that with the pump curve at speed two. And this is uh, something that you can do on every one of our boilers that has an internal pump. We give you what's left over after the boiler has used some of that pump, what you can use externally to that. So again, there just shows you the wiring to the external pump there. Now we have a flow and temperature combination um, input or output sensor. Uh, it is coming from one pin connector on the one uh, on the on the device, which is measuring flow and outlet water temperature. And it breaks breaks into two plugs in here. You see, these are two different sizes; they cannot be swapped. Um, so that you have flow and temperature. Why is it more wires for the flow? Because it's actually an active, active transducer. Where the temperature sensor is just a, a 10K thermistor, um, the, the pressure uh, is an actual flow device. So it's actually giving you flow in real time, which you can read on the control. Then there's the pressure sensor that's sitting down here underneath. Uh, and again, it is a pressure active sensor. So it's looking at the active pressure in the set in the boiler. And it does have that seven PSI limit. Now, just a little hint for housekeeping here for you. If you're working on this boiler, this is slightly at is probably at the bottom point of this boiler. So even if you isolate it and drain the boiler down, there's always going to be a little bit of water in here. So just be aware of that. And take that sensor out, have a small bucket. It's not going to be a whole lot of water. Um, just a little bit that's, you know, in this between here and here kind of thing. Uh, and it will drain out from there. Again, when we go back to the power unit, remember all the 240 volt comes into this box here, this board. Uh, so the main controller has to get power from somewhere. So there's an outlet terminals for L1 and L2 that goes out to the 240 volt input. So when the contactors break and we lose power to this board, we will also lose power to this device, an example of a high limit uh, cutout. Then to get control of the triax, the controller has to send signal back. So on the power unit, it sends the signal out, which comes from the, from the controller out to the power unit. And this is where we get the staging of the triax. And as the triax are on or off, You'll see the red LEDs here are on or off. You can't tell from the LEDs whether it's full power or half power. Um, I found that you can't even put an amp meter on it really and tell when we're at half of the track because my amp meter doesn't respond fast enough to the switching of the tracks. Uh, I'm actually going to bring my oscilloscope into the office one day and see if I can actually see it on an oscilloscope uh, because I, I haven't been able to see it even on the, on the, uh, the power meter we have in the lab. Um, but it is it is going to be on or off if these tracks are powered. You're going to see the LED is on when they're closed. So when we look at the limit circuit, there's two limits. There's the adjustable high limit and the, and the fixed high limit. The, fi the adjustable high limit sitting down here is the lower of the two. is automatic reset. It's set at 140 degrees. And it will get its um, loop from the power board. It comes out of the power board, through the limit, and back to the power board. Now, I asked 
can we measure the voltage here to see if the board is sending the right signal? Uh, the answer I got is that, yes, there's a voltage there, but there's no neutral common point for that voltage. Uh, so what you're going to see when you measure it, you can tell if the limit's open or closed with the voltmeter, but you can't really see if this is sending power out if the switch is closed um, because it doesn't have a neutral point to, to get a, a voltage reference off it. I think it's somewhere around 5 volts from what I understand, uh, but it, all it is is really we're sending a signal out to this limit. It's coming back. If the limit is open, then it will open all the gates of all the tracks. So it's not taking the power off of the tracks. It's just opening the gate circuit. Remember, the gate circuit is what actually turns the triac on and off. And again, automatic reset type. Now, the fixed high limit is different. It is a manual reset button. It is tied into the circuit so where it will shut off everything. So where we come from the main power, it goes through the 240-volt to 24-volt transformer, through the fuse that's there, then to the limit. If the limit is open... The contactors will not have power for the coils, and they will open, and the entire boiler, including the display, the control, everything is turned off. And I'll, I'll go into a little more detail why we do that level of shutdown for these. So manual reset, if it's got hit into that temperature, you're going to have to wait to get it back through the differential before you can reset it, of course. Um, but if you've ever lost this limit, if it ever trips, you need to find out why, because this is not a normal scenario. And it is set at 194C, or Fahrenheit, uh, 90C. So then we have the return water temperature. This is the return T in is return water temperature. And what we have here is a sensor that's mounted on the plate that's sitting on top of the tracks. This is, I think, is a really cool thing that they did with this boiler. Um, if you guys are familiar with with any kind of electronics where they have the SCRs or tracks or, trans or transistors or anything like that, we know they all generate heat. And when we generate heat, typically we put a heat sink on them, and the heat sink then dissipates the heat into the air, and it's lost. What we've done here is we've actually using the water in the system, the return water in the system, to cool the triacs. So rather than dumping the heat into the atmosphere unless it's lost heat, we're actually putting it into the return water temperature, into the return water piping. So we're actually using the electronic heat, waste heat from these triacs that are switching on and off to make the electric elements go, and we're putting it into the water. Now, because of that, this temperature here might be a little bit higher than the actual return water temperature when you measure it. So if you were to put a, a thermometer on the supply and return, you might get a different return water temperature slightly lower than this return water temperature or the temperature inlet here. And that's because now we have also have the heat of the tracks adding to it. But it's kind of a cool system. I thought, you know, when they when I saw this, I went, that's kind of forward thinking. Again, it is also a 10K thermistor as connected to the T input. And here's kind of how it works. So we got the water coming back from the boiler or from the system, there's our pump. And it's going through here and it's attached to this great big copper plate there's the screws that tie on to the track's heat sink settings, the heat sink position. And so that heat is being migrated from the heat sink into here. And that's why this temperature sensor is reading a combination of the return water and the heat sink temperature. We get into the what we control, the inputs now. We get into a, a point called the OP terminal. I, I kind of alluded to this before. What it is, is come, it comes with a factory jumper. You can see the factory jumper down here. And what it does is it is designed that a power utility could say, well, we're at our peak rate today or peak rate at this time of day. Um, and so we were going to send a signal to our homeowners, to our end users to say, uh, we're at the peak rate, disable your electric devices. So electric strip heaters or electric boilers or electric whatever. And it is a lot of times sent by the utilities so that you don't have to you know, calculate when the peak rates are. You're only going to use this boiler at the lower rates, at the lower rates, that kind of thing. So that's what it's designed for. But you could use it for any external limit circuit. And there's ways that you can see whether that circuit is open and closed in relation to the thermostat. So the next device is going to be the thermostat. And, it, and by the way, it's a dry contact. It's not, not powered. The next device is a thermostat. And this is where your room thermostat would work, uh, would be connected uh, in a home, that kind of thing. Uh, so you have two start-stop limits. This one is the thermostat, and the OP is the override of the of the call for heat. 
again, dry, dry contact, no voltage. Um, just the same as you would be on a TT contact on a thermostat on a, on a traditional heating system. And the outdoor temperature sensor. You do not have to use the outdoor temperature sensor with this boiler. If you use it, the boiler will, will automatically set itself up for you to set a heating curve. So here's something that I, I found just from playing with this boiler and talking to the engineering on this boiler, that uh, if you want a backup, if you want, say, I don't want to lose heat when the outdoor sensor fails, before you hook up the outdoor sensor, power the boiler up and set whatever your default temperature should be. So you can set manually what your water temperature you want to be as a default. It's a fixed number. It's that number all the time. And then when you hook up the outdoor sensor, the control automatically switched out to reset. And then you can set a heating curve for that. But if the sensor ever shorts or fails open, the boiler will revert back to the fixed set point. It won't not have a set point. So just a little hand, housekeeping thing to maybe help you out there. And how do I know if the boiler is, is actually using the fixed set point or the um, weather compensated heating curve? On the display, when, the, when you're on the heating um, icon, it'll show you the current set point. If there's a red LED beside it here, you see at the bottom down here, then that means that it's outdoor reset. If you don't see the red LED, then it's a fixed set point, and you will be able to use the control to adjust the temperature. So if you look at this device here, we got this slide here, we got no outdoor sensor. So when I see 110, I do not see the red dot, and I can see when I'm in this mode here is the heating, and that's the set point in Fahrenheit, obviously. And I can use the up and down arrow keys to set my set point all the way up to 140. Now, with an electric boiler, it's important that we size the appliance properly to the heat load. And that typically means we have to do a, a, a decent kind of a heat loss calculation. It's important that we don't undersize these boilers or we don't oversize these boilers by too much. So we want to make sure that our boiler selection is in, within the guide, you know, the range of the, of the heat demand that we have. Uh, so, you know, I don't like putting math in presentations like this. Uh, I know there are present presenters out there that just love to give you formulas, but I'm not one of those. Uh, but I'm going to give you one today. It, first thing you need to know is how to calculate BTUs, because we're typically doing heat loss in North America. We're doing in BTUs, right? We're doing this building has a load of X, right? And we can convert BTUs by kilowatts by dividing BTUs by 3413. So example, I've done my heat loss calculation on this house. I need 36,000 BTUs to heat the water. And that means that I'm looking for approximately 10.5 kilowatts. So to choose the boiler I want, I have to have a boiler that meets the 10.5 kilowatts, but doesn't exceed it by more than 20%. Because we don't want the triax fighting fighting the load by switching a lot uh we don't want the boiler to be you know too oversized that it's it's not good it's it's more money it's more uh labor to you know all these things to, to deal with it maintenance wise so let's just not oversize it so when i look at the 10.5 kilowatts 120 percent of that is 12.6 kilowatts roughly or approximately 43,200 btus now if i look at the three boilers that are in the range I see my 8 kilowatt boiler only produces 27,000 BTUs. That is not big enough to handle the base load I need of the 36,000. And if I look at the uh, 14 kilowatt boiler, it is 49,000 BTUs, which is more than 20%. It's, so it's more than the 43,200, that's 20%. So my choice should be the, 40, uh, the 12 kilowatt, which is 40,956 BTUs which is between the 36,000 I need for my heat load and the 43,000 I need for my minimum or for my 20% oversize. So that's how I'm going to size any of these electric boilers. And I think that's that's a pretty good housekeeping, pretty rule of thumb for any time you're sizing an electric appliance um, in, in the system. So for larger systems, we might want to do primary, secondary. Um, and we might want to do more than one boiler. And we can stage these boilers as much as we want. The challenge we're going to have is that Beesman doesn't have a control to do this at the current time. So you would need a third-party staging control that can also manage your downstream pumps. The boiler, obviously, because the auxiliary pump output here is not going to be able to do this here, you're going to need a third-party control to do that. Now, when we look at the control, there's a bunch of different 
inputs and display points. So this is my LED display, which is going to tell me the, the data from whatever icons I see here lit up. So we have the BTUs times 100. So it'll tell me in, in the BTUs time, times 100, in, it gives me 30, thousands of BTUs per hour. I have the PSI, which is going to give me the pressure currently in the boiler. I have the gallons per minute, which is going to give me the current flow rate through the boiler. I have the Fahrenheit. Temperature is always in Fahrenheit in this boiler. There's no Celsius output for it. And it will tell me whether the heating operation is on here. The LED beside this will tell me whether it's heating or not heating. I'll go in a little bit more detail of this in the troubleshooting part. Uh, pump call is the pump being told to be on. Again, there's a couple of ways that that LED lights up, which we'll talk about in a little bit. The little box with the arrow going out is the outlet temperature. The little box with the arrow going in is the return temperature. Remember, the return temperature is going to be Measure from that sensor, that return water sensor that's on the heat sink. And then the call for heat, this symbol here will be on depending on whether there's a call for heat from the thermostat. And it will also give us an indication whether we have the OP terminal open. And again, in the troubleshooting part of this presentation, I'll do that. So we have a power button, which is really a standby button. It doesn't turn the electric off to the boiler, just puts the control in the standby. Up and down arrows to make adjustments. There is no save button. So when I make an adjustment, moving on to the next point saves it. And then the scroll button scrolls through. There Again, there's no back button. You're just going around and forward in circles. If we stop pushing buttons for a minute, the control will go back to the home display. So let's look at how the different things work. We have the little house symbol. This is our heating status. When it's green steady on, that means the thermostat is calling. When it's not on, the thermostat is not calling. When it's on but blinking, that means the thermostat is calling, but the OP terminal is open. So now I can see, is the thermostat and the OP closed, or is it just the thermostat that's closed? The pump, again, will have a steady on if the pump is running, and it will blink if the pump is supposed to be running, but it hasn't met the minimum flow requirement. Uh, there's a couple of ways we can use with this, and you'll often see that when pump gets a call, it'll flash for a couple seconds before the flow gets up and meets the minimum uh, limit. Um, but there is another way we can look at this as far as um, in, a, in a cold startup scenario. Some LEDs on the circuit board, these are pretty much repeated of what's in them on the other part, but one that's different is this little one here, status. It will flash continuously flash when the boiler is in when the, the circuit the computer inside is communicating with the various parts of the boiler. So this is what I was talking about before. So if you have a system that's full of glycol and the boiler's been off and it's been sitting let's say in a cottage and it's really cold and somebody who turns on the system, you may, because of the condition, the the, the, the viscosity of that glycol, not get the pump to be able to pump at the full rate until we get some heat there. So what will happen is the pump will start, that LED beside it will flicker like it's not making this the system uh, flow rate. Uh, and the OP, as long as the OP terminal and the TT contacts are closed, it will run like this for a few minutes until the system starts to warm up. So we'll be able to get the heat elements running before we see full flow. And then after we get full flow, the glycol will thin out and you'll get the flow rate you want and then the, it'll stop blinking. While it's doing that, you'll get on the display dash, two dash, three dash, dash, two dash, three dash. That tells you it's in the cold startup um, function. On the outlet, this tells me whether we've got heat on or not. So a red... LED means that we have a call for heat and it, the heater elements are actually on. A green light tells me that the boiler has a call for heat. The room temperature is, you know, below the set point or the, you know, it, it has a demand for heat, but the water in the boiler is above the current set point, which means that we have a call for heat. The pump is running, but the elements aren't on. And then off means off. Again, looking at the outdoor reset, if there's a dot beside it, that's the outdoor reset calculated temperature, and I could adjust the heating curve to make changes to that. Without a dot beside it, it means it doesn't have an outdoor sensor that it sees, and this is a fixed set point, and I can turn the temperature up and down from here. 
We've got, um, remember the arrow in is water temperature return, temperature, water temperature out, temperature. Gallons per minute, this is in this case 2.8, PSI 15.0. Now here we got 477 times 100, so it's 47,700. And the outdoor temperature in Fahrenheit 32 or whatever the temperature is. Now, when you get to warm weather shutdown, we would prefer you don't turn this boiler completely off. Don't shut off the disconnect on that little panel that you have beside it or the breaker or whatever, because we want to keep this boiler in a standby mode. To get in standby mode, you push the power button for three seconds, and the boiler will go into standby. And you'll know it's in standby because the display will go blank, except for the LED on the bottom right-hand corner will flash every two or three seconds. The reason why we want to do that is we want to keep the pump in its exercise mode. It will start for 15 minutes one time a day during standby mode. This helps protect the pump from getting stuck for silting or whatever. Uh, it also exercises the flow rate through the system. Uh, just as a, a, a note, whenever you put it in standby, that's the time of day it will exercise the pump. So if you put the pump in standby at 6 p.m., water in standby at 6 p.m., it will run that pump every day at 6 p.m. for 15 minutes. If you do it at midnight, it'll run the pump every day at midnight for 15 minutes. To get it back out of standby, you then push the standby button hold for three seconds, and the control will go back in automatic. So when we get into programming, we can do that, and we do that specifically in a certain key function. So you push the power button and hold it for three seconds. You'll go into standby. Then you're going to push and hold the the um, uh, forward button. Then immediately press the power button and release it. And what happens is the boiler will go into a programming mode here where you can use the up and down and the forward button to do different functions. When you're done programming, you just push the power button again, and it will go back into automatic. So what programming do we have? The first one we're not going to use really unless we're replacing a heat exchanger. Basically, it tells us the control, or rather, replacing a control. It tells the boiler what size of boiler it's control, what size of boiler it's in. So it's already factory set. The pump might be something we want to change. There's two functions: either automatic or manual. So a PA is automatic, PN is manual, and that means that the pump runs 24/7. PA only runs the pumps when the call for heat is closed by the thermostat. Again, this one here, we don't probably won't do anything with. It tells me how many heater elements. This boiler always has three heater elements. Uh, I think the control has future functionality built into it already, so that's why they give you that choice. Um, interestingly enough, I told you that there was a minimum pressure sensing. This boiler, you can turn it off. I'm not sure why you would ever want to do that, but in this programming mode, you can turn the pressure sensor off. Where the boiler comes out of warmer, the shutdown between 30 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit, or nothing. So you can turn it off and then the boiler will run at whatever set point it's given all year round. Uh, when you have outdoor reset, uh, then this will only run basically when it's between those, um, above those outdoor temperatures, or below those outdoor temperatures. Heating curves, we have two values, slope and we have shift. So we have slope here and shift there. And again, we could put that into zero, and that would eliminate the outdoor reset and go back to fixed set point if we wanted to just do that for some reason temporarily. And when we get to this mode here, the display will show me the current hours on the boiler. There's our heating curve. Works very similar to anything else we do with heating curve. You've got a slope adjustment. you got a shift adjustment. So the slope default is four, and the shift default is zero. So you have a heating curve that will look like this for the default four based on this number, and the shift zero based on this. You notice we don't use the whole thing as zero. Uh, we're using just lowercase for this. Um, and we can go minus nine to plus nine. If you have an EEE or dashes right on, EEE means that there's a problem in the, dis in the, in the main board. It probably will mean the main board needs to be replaced. Dashes could mean there's a bad parameter, so it's a failed sensor. Um, if you're looking at, let's say, the return water sensor and you get dash, 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 that's an indication that the sensor has a problem. Let's look quickly at some troubleshooting. I know I'm running out of time here. Again, flashing green, green light on the pressure sensor means we're below the pressure. And if there's no indication, it means that there's pressure sensors failed. Flashing GPM light tells me that we've got lower than the flow rate. 
uh, that's required. Uh, again, if there's enough flow rate, it'll be on all the time, uh, steady. And if you don't get the sensor, you don't get green at all, it's going to mean you got a bad, probably a flow sensor or pressure, yeah, flow sensor in this case. Again, we talked about the pump. So the 2.1 is the threshold that this is going to be as a minimum. I know we say the 1.3 at the original, which is the minimum flow rate, but the thing is already set at 2.1. So anything below 2.1 will give us a flashing light. And get no thermostat or, or the thermostat's open. We have the flashing green light for the thermostat, or for the heating call rather. And if it's at flashing, that means that the thermostat contact is closed, but the OP terminal is open. And we have the dashes for again for sensor failure. Again, we talked about that, so I won't go into too much detail. We talked about cleaning the uh, strainer. It's probably a good idea to take a look at it at least annually, at least at the initially of when you install the boiler. So my triac is closed. I should have power from L1 to L2 through the heater. And if I measured my voltage across the heater, I should get 240 volts. If my triac is open, then I don't have any circuit here, so I should have zero volts. But what if my triac is failed? Then I could get 240 volts across here, even though this is supposed to be open if the triac has failed. So how do I know if the triac is in good shape or not? This is where this X4, X3, X2, X1 come in. Remember, X4 to X1 or X2 or X3 will be the 240 volts. It'll tell me that my contactors are closed. I got power to that part. Okay. But if I go from X4 to H1, it will tell me whether my triac is closed for heating circuit one. If I go from X4 to H2, it'll tell me if the triac is closed here. X4 to H3, it'll tell me if the triac is closed here. So I can then troubleshoot whether my contact or whether my triac is closed. And I can say, well, I don't have an LED here that tells me it's closed. It's not supposed to be on. I know I don't have a call for heat. Why do I have the triac closed? Because the triac maybe is fused. So this is a quick way to troubleshoot that to see if you have power to the triacs where you're not supposed to have. The other thing we do to test heating elements on electric appliance is what they call a megger test. Now, not all of us have a megger. Um, it is something that the electricians typically have. Um, but in the heating logic world, we a lot of us don't have a, a megger. Um, some of our newer um, higher end multimeters will have a meg ohm setting, which you can use. But basically, the megger tells me what the resistance across the element is. And you can check the element to see if it's lost some of its uh, resistance to ground. And why is that important? Because we could have an element where the insulating factor of the element itself has been broken down because it's corroded or whatever. And we'll have a contact where we'll, our power circuit inside will actually be talking to the water, communicating with the water. And that means that you see what happens here, even though my triac is open, my, my limit is open, right? I don't have any heat going all the way through the element, but my ground of the water through the remainder of the element to L2 is going to be there. So these two parts here are part of the high limit circuit. So there's my mechanical high limit. So this is why it's important that we shut down the entire boiler because if it has a scenario like this, then we have a problem where we're gonna have a runaway heater. So again, what we do here is we, we see this water temperature rising and rising and rising because this heater element is never shut off because it's bleeding from water ground to L2. And once the high limit hits 240, it will break the power on both L1 and L2 and that stops it. And again, that shuts down the entire boiler operation. All the Everything electrically inside the boiler other than the input uh, terminal blocks is down. So then let's just quickly look at some piping layouts. So we have a simple system here, primary, secondary, boiler pump, and this pump could be run by the boiler's accessory output. Again, runs off for three minutes, maximum fusing, maximum power through the pump is fused at two amps. So your pump shouldn't draw any more than an amp based on you know fuse size to load by the electrical codes. Then we have one boiler, Pump without primary secondary because we've done the calculation through the head loss uh, pump curve and said each of these circuits when they're both calling for heat don't have uh, a, don't have more flow or head requirement than what's left over in this pump can handle. We might have to put circuit setters or balancing valves in here so that they equal out. 
but we can certainly then use just the boiler pump. We do not need primary secondary. If we do need primary secondary, then again, we can only control, control one pump here. So what we're going to do is have the pumps controlled by third-party control. But in this case, we also have two boilers. So that's also going to be the staging control. Now, I talked a little about earlier about heat pumps. I want to spend a couple of minutes I got left talking about how we can use this boiler really efficiently in a heat pump system. Now, this drawing is overkill. I'm going to tell you that right away. Uh, I put this drawing together for a virtual concept of a heat pump system for our new heat pump designs, and it is overkill. And I'm going to tell you it's overkill. You know, most likely we do not need the electric water here. Most likely we don't even need the electric boilers because on our new heat pump system, the distribution in it will have its own electric in it. So we have the out uh, monoblock, which is the whole heat pump system. We're bringing glycol into here. And then this is going to distribute it to either my mixed valve circuit or my high temperature circuit. We got a buffer tank sitting on top of here, which gives me some buffer. And we have an indirect tank. But in case of a system where we don't have this electric backup, then we can add electric boilers here, looking at the buffer tank temperature to say, hey, when the heat pump gets below a certain set, set point, it will send a signal to the boiler to say, hey, we need, we need the backup heat. Then the electric boilers will satisfy the load in the buffer tank. So this gives us all the requirements for redundancy and heat or backup heat, because currently in North America, every jurisdiction I know, um, and I may be no wrong, there might be areas that don't have this, we require an auxiliary form of heat when you install a heat pump, uh, especially in northern climates like, uh, you know, upper U.S., west coast and and uh, mid mid um, of the U.S. and upper, you know, can they, anywhere in Canada uh, other than maybe like down in the Windsor area. Uh, you'll need backup heat because your heat pump just won't give you the, the, the COP you need for those cold, cold temperatures. So this allows us to, again, to put the boiler as the backup electric boiler, as the backup heat, keeps the entire system electrified. So again, for a lot of these um, jurisdictional changes, uh, they wouldn't let you use um, a gas-fired or propane-fired or oil-fired boiler, boiler to do this because the whole point is to get off of fossil fuel. Um, they might let you use a hydrogen powered boiler but we don't we're not going to see that really readily available for a number of years uh, Viesman's boilers will be hydrogen ready in, in the next year or two uh, but other than that you're not going to see anything and getting hydrogen to the boiler that's the problem um, but they will let you use an electric boiler to do that right again with the unit we're developing here it's going to have up to nine kilowatts right here in this unit here so you really won't need the electric boilers but I just wanted to show it as a concept uh, for anybody who, who really wanted to know that. And that's all I have. How are we doing, Scott? You're spot on time. Yeah, I tried. Very nice. Nicely done, man. Nice soft landing there. Yeah. That's a, yeah, that's a great presentation. Just went through just from introduction to some troubleshooting there. So I, I just sit back at a lot out of it. And lots of stuff on that boiler, this boiler, like you know, your flow sensors and pressure sensors, built-in pumps and secondary outputs and stuff. So it is a outdoor reset. So it's a pretty easy little boiler to kind of work with because you got a lot of stuff already included with it, right? So you don't have to add mm -hmm. on uh, a lot of those extra pieces to it. Uh, so yeah, thanks very much. That was good. Good. And we didn't have too many questions. So that's good. either either. Oh, we had a few it... questions. Yeah. Just a couple on the related to relief valves and stuff like that, but yeah. uh, okay, good. Other than that, yeah, I echo as well. Very nicely done job there, Mark. So good job. Thank well, you very you much. You did a good job in the background to answer those questions. So that's good. Oh, you know yeah, exactly. In between my chewing my toast and drinking my coffee, I had. Uh, well, I could tell you what uh, guys are doing out here this way is uh, we've had some applications where the they're taking these boilers just because you don't have to worry about venting. It condensate connections are literally just a, a, you know, not just, but a, a you know, a, a 230 volt circuit you need to add in. And uh, we see uh, these boilers being kind of placed where the manifolds are, say for radiant systems, and yeah. they're putting them per floor, right? So yeah, you got, they're, instead they're, of having one big boiler, they're putting multiple smalls. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of, and you, you have everything in the boiler, you need the pressure relief valve, the bypass, everything's in there. So it's, it's like a turnkey, right? Or you need Absolutely. to hook up, hook up the water to it and the power to it, and it's a go. Yeah, 
you don't have to worry about primary, secondary a lot of times in those cases when you do that. So it yep. just makes it for a much simpler setup as far as your system goes. And you got a little bit of redundancy there. So if there's any yep. issues, you're not losing the whole house. You're, you might be losing the floor or whatever. So yeah. And the internal but, pressure uh, bypass yeah. allows that you can have zones in a radiant system starting to shut down and not under pump the boiler. Absolutely. Yeah. Like I say, it's got all those, got all those little gadgets in there that, you know, it's hydronic specialties. You kind of, we, yeah, we've seen a lot of presentations for low mass boilers where we always recommend those, right? And this yeah. boiler actually has all that stuff already yeah, built in. So everything's you don't have to worry inside. About that. Yeah. Oh, I don't see good. any more questions. I think we're done. Well, uh, thanks everybody for showing up. And uh, if you have any yeah. other questions, make sure you send us an email. You can send it to webinars at vsman.com and uh, sorry, webinars at vsman.ca. And uh, mm -hmm. I will get those and we'll, we'll add those to the Q and A list.